do you believe in the saying, the truth will set you free? I mean, it's a nice thought, but we all know that sometimes innocent people go to jail. In fact, statistics say about 1% of prisoners shouldn't be there. But then again, that means 99% of people behind bars probably do belong there. The trick is figuring out which is which, and that's what this case is all about. Detectives say Sandra Melgar killed her husband, then staged an elaborate home invasion to cover it up. A jury agreed, but she still insists she's innocent. So what really happened on that fateful night? Let's get into it. I'm Amy. Thanks for watching True Crime Recaps. So Sandra Melgar and her husband Jim were married for 32 years. They met their senior year in high school when Sandy moved to Houston, Texas. Jim had grown up there after immigrating from Guatemala with his family when he was three. Sandy, super cute, sat in front of him in class, and after their first date, the two of them were inseparable. By 2012, they were still in Houston with now a grown-up daughter who had a husband of her own. And Jim was months away from retiring from his IT job, and Sandy owned a medical billing and coding company so she could work from home. She suffered from lupus, epilepsy, and rheumatoid arthritis, health issues that kept her dependent on Jim, even asking him to drive most places for fear that she might have a seizure while she was behind the wheel. By all accounts, they had a loving, happy marriage with a tight-knit group of friends and strong ties to the Jehovah Witness church community. Now, her faith later is used as a motive for murder, so just keep that in mind. Now, that night started off as a celebration of their love. On December 22nd, 2012, Jim and Sandra decided to treat themselves to dinner at their favorite Mexican restaurant. Now, personally, I cannot think of a better way to celebrate 32 years of marriage than with some delicious Mexican food. That is for real. Now, from the restaurant, they headed home, but they stopped at CVS to pick up a few mixers for cocktails. Also, fun night. Back at the house, they adjourned to their jacuzzi tub in their bathroom with their drinks, some strawberries, whipped cream. Boom, just go, bam, bam, bam. I don't know. You know, that thing. They got intimate in the tub. They were, it, it, it was their anniversary. So after two hours of that, their four dogs started barking in the backyard. So Jim got out, wrapped a towel around himself, and went to let the dogs in. Now, that should have taken him only a minute or two, but he didn't come back right away. Sandra figured he'd gotten distracted downstairs, so she got out of the water, went over to her walk-in closet to put on her nightgown, and that's where she says her memories of the night end. Now, the next day, December 23rd, Jim and Sandy were supposed to host a family get-together. When Jim's brother and his family arrived around four-ish that afternoon, no one answered their knock, but one of the two garage doors was open open and inside was a door that you know opened onto the family's laundry room so he tried the handle and it turned in his hand when they walked in they knew right away that the house had this eerie feeling you know like something terrible had happened and moments later they hear muffled screams coming from upstairs they followed the cries for help to sandra's bathroom closet but Important point here, to open the door, they had to remove the chair that had been wedged under the door handle. Sandy was face down on the floor in the closet, still wearing her black satin nightgown. Her hands and feet were tied with scarves. She'd like urinated, defecated. I mean, she'd been in there. The knots were so tight around her wrists and ankles that they had to cut through them with scissors. Now, 30 feet away in the second closet was Jim's naked, bloody body. A gray phone cord was wrapped around his legs, and a red rope was loosely tied around his chest. Blood spattered the closet walls with some also on a chair and a stool in the bedroom. He'd been stabbed 31 times. The murder weapon, a butcher knife from their kitchen, had been tossed into their bathwater along with a woman's white shirt and a green scarf. Sandra didn't see or hear anything, she says. She had a bump on the back of her head, possibly from a seizure or an assailant knocking her out. She couldn't remember. All she would say is that she woke up in her closet, racked with pain, unable to move. Now, at first, it appeared to be a home invasion gone wrong. There had been at least one similar attack in the area, but in that case, the homeowners survived. I mean, they're beaten and, you know, totally traumatized, but otherwise, okay. 
Sandra's purse and wallet were on the bed, like someone had gone through them, but the credit cards had all been left behind. Dresser drawers were open in the main bedroom and guest rooms, but detectives stopped short of using the word ransacked. It was more like someone had rifled through them, leaving most items in place, they said, neatly folded. But unknown DNA from a male and female were found on the dresser handles. The only items that seemed to be missing were prescription pills, including phenobarbital and hydrocodone. Now, strangely, their daughter's old backpack turned up in the garage, filled with some video games and a player taken from the house. And there was a small safe in the closet where Jim was found, but it hadn't been opened. However, the handle was smeared with blood, but it was never tested. So there's no way of knowing if it was Jim's or someone else. It probably wasn't Sandra's, though. Her hands were clean with no scratch marks other than a very small one on her finger, and her fingernails weren't chipped or broken. The only bruises she had were on her upper arms. Now, two hours after responding to the 911 call, while CSI was still working the crime scene, nothing's been analyzed yet, the detectives were on the phone with the DA hoping to charge Sandra with murder. Their first and only theory was that Sandra murdered Jim for two possible reasons. Well, kind of three possible reasons, because number one, it's usually the husband slash wife if one of the spouses dies. Okay, that's that's fair. Number two was the money. Jim had a $500,000 life insurance policy. Now, the couple wasn't strapped for cash. They were comfortable, but they must have thought, the police must have thought like, hey, who couldn't use an extra 500 grand? And the number two reason for murder in their minds was Jehovah. Divorce is serious business to a Jehovah witness, seriously frowned on. They figured she wanted out, but she also wanted to keep her standing in the church, so she turned to murder. Clearly, there are a few issues with that theory, but between the money and the religion, the DA thought there might be something to it. And about a year and a half after the murder, in the summer of 2014, Sandra Melgar was indicted for the murder of her husband. It was hard to understand why the detectives thought they had an airtight case to take to trial, especially when you consider the fact that Sandra was found tied up in a barricaded closet. But in 2017, it went to trial. So let me walk you through the highlights. Jim had been beaten and stabbed 31 times. All of his injuries were defense wounds inflicted on his face, his hands, his chest versus his back. But the skull fractures were particularly brutal. His eye sockets were cracked. His skull was fractured. And one cut to his thumb hit an artery that caused a lot of that blood splatter. Jim was fighting back. Now, Sandra was a frail five foot four. She walked with a cane. He was maybe an inch or two taller, although the prosecution said she outweighed him, but not by much. And none of Jim's DNA was found under her fingernails and vice versa. None of hers was under his. The couple kept a loaded gun in the closet where Jim was found, but as far as they could tell, he didn't make a move to grab it. Now, on one hand, you can hear those facts and say, what the freak? How would she ever be able to inflict that kind of damage on him? Never mind why she would suddenly morph from a loving wife celebrating her anniversary into a bloodthirsty killer. But forget that for a moment. Let's just focus on the how of it all. The prosecution speculated that she lured him out of the tub and into the bedroom with some kind of sex game. She got him to sit in a chair by the bed where she tied his feet with the phone cord, then went to town on him with the knife and possibly her cane. Then somehow the fight moved into the closet where she killed him. They say the gun wasn't touched because Jim was trying to fight her off, not kill her. However, their daughter, there's a few holes. Their daughter says that the chair by that bed wasn't moved there for some nefarious or even sexy purpose. It was always there so the dogs could use it to hop up on the bed. And then there's the way Sandra was found. How on earth could she wedge a chair under the closet door from the inside? How is she going to tie bonds so tight she had to be cut free? It seems impossible, but the prosecution had an explanation. Pillow shams. Let me explain. So instead of bath mats, the couple used pillow shams. There were two in the main bathroom. They think Sandra shut the closet door behind her this is like worthy of James Bond, slid the chair under the doorknob using a pillow sham from inside the closet 
and then she bound her feet together with a scarf, managed to wrap a pre-knotted scarf around her wrist and pull it tight behind her back. But here's the thing, the pillowcase they thought she used was still in the bathroom, not in the closet with her. So how does that work? Maybe it's me, but it just, it doesn't make any sense. But I mean, it is just me and you, I don't know, but because she was found guilty. But for investigators, the only thing that didn't make sense was how she could claim not to have heard Jim being murdered just 30 feet away even if she did have a seizure like she'd claimed. So after she was found, they took her down to the station to get more information before taking her to the hospital. Station, station first, then hospital, important point. So while they talked, they asked her point blank several times if she killed her husband. Of course, she said no. But when they asked her to take a polygraph, she refused, explaining that she was upset, she's traumatized, she didn't think it was a good idea. When they pressed her, she asked for a lawyer. Now, the bottom line was that it all just seemed a little too convenient for her to black out at the same time that her husband was being killed. And as far as that went, the prosecution revealed that Sandra had apparently not reported having a seizure for many years years, even though her family said it was a real concern. But the validity of her illness came into question. And then, of course, there was that divorce theory. Now, their friends and family insisted they'd never seen a happier couple. There was never even a hint of divorce. And if there was, they say she could have gotten a divorce and still maintained relationships with her church community. Would it have been dramatic, possibly embarrassing, maybe a little scandalous? Sure, maybe, but did it justify murder? Seems unlikely, but that was the prosecution's case. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the defense's theory, and the key is the barking dogs. So when Jim opened the back door, he let in the intruders, which is why there were no signs of forced entry. They marched him back upstairs where they possibly took out Sandra and dragged her into the closet. That would explain the bruises on her upper arms. At some point, Jim started to fight back and the situation got homicidal from there. Though evidence was taken into custody, none of the officials took a latent print of the bloody fingerprint from the safe, and they didn't take into account the strange DNA found on the dresser and on the scarf that bound her arms and legs. Interestingly, a couple of years later, the lead detective was fired for some shady behavior on another murder case. When they cleaned out his office, they found some evidence from the Melgar case in his files, unexamined and untested. There were also questions about a neighbor's bizarre behavior when Jim's body was found. Now, reports say this man was hanging around a long time, like longer than normal, watching the cops come and go, asking a lot of questions, generally acting real suspiciously. In the days following, police attempted to speak with him, but they couldn't reach him. Whether he was ducking them on purpose or he had nothing to do with anything, Who knows? He was never followed up on, and no links were drawn between the Melgar case and the other home invasion, most likely because that one didn't end in murder. So after about three weeks of testimony from both sides, Sandra Melgar was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 27 years in prison. Since then, her family and friends have been working hard to prove her innocence. They got a higher court to look over the trial proceedings in 2020, but they upheld the original ruling, mostly because they couldn't see any new evidence, meaning they couldn't examine the DNA or other evidence that had gone untested. But Sandra's team didn't give up. Attorney Kathleen Zellner, she's the one who rose to fame after her work in the Netflix series, Making a Murderer. She joined Sandra's defense and at the time was working to garner more DNA testing and evidence that could exonerate her. Until results from that comes back, who knows when, she remains behind bars. So what do you think? Did she do it? Did she do it for the money? Did she do it to save face at church? Was there really a home invasion? What stands out to you? Let's talk about it in the comments. In the meantime, thank you so much for letting us catch you up on this case. If you like getting all the crime in half the time as much as we like giving it to you, then please stick around, watch another recap. It's coming up right now. Until then, see you soon.